Brothers and sisters, please join me in a word of prayer. Gracious Father, we come before you today with varying heavy hearts. Uh, But above all, Lord, we put our trust in you for our protection, for our safety, and for all the provisions that you give us in life that we so often take for granted. Father, we pray that you enter this space by the power of your Holy Spirit. We pray that you reveal yourself to all of us in your word and in your sacrament. Open our eyes and ears to your gospel message. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts, I pray these may be found acceptable and pleasing in your sight. For you alone, O Lord, are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I have set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. On September 13th, 2001, this is only two days after our nation's greatest terrorist attack, evangelical leader Jerry Falwell appeared on the popular television program called The 700 Club, which was hosted by Pat Robertson. Like many people at this time, Falwell was lamenting on the recent events that took place in D.C., uh, in Pennsylvania, and in New York City. And while he was relaying these things in his mind, he said this on the 700 Club. The pagans and the abortionists and the feminists and the gays and the lesbians and all those who are trying to make that an attractive lifestyle and all of those who try to secularize America, I point the finger in their face and say, you helped this happen. To which Pat Robertson replied, I concur completely. When disasters strike in a way that seem completely out of our control, God is often placed on trial in many of our minds. We ask, how could God let this happen? Doesn't God love the victims of terrorist attacks, of violent protests, of mass shootings? Where is God in all of this? In response to this common question, I find that there are two typical responses from our culture, each equally damaging to our understanding of who God is. The first is to blame God himself. If this sort of thing happens, God must not be the loving and kind savior that I was told he was in church. God must be a tyrant in this case. He must be some kind of bully who takes and destroys things as he pleases. If this is the case, then we cannot honestly say that God is good. The second response is the same response of the friends of Job, who offered him varying kinds of advice on his misfortune. And it is the same response as our friend Jerry Falwell. The victims of disaster must have done something wrong to be in the predicament that they face. They must have committed some horrible sin to deserve the tragedy that's befallen on them. With this in mind, it's no surprise that after a tragic event takes place in our country, The next week or so is consumed with the media trying to find who they can blame for what happened, trying to pin the tragedy on some face or some cause. Oddly enough, it's hardly ever the criminal or the perpetrator that gets the blunt, the brunt of this blame, but it generally falls on those whom we already harbor some kind of angry bias against. Gun owners, Muslims, Trump supporters or Biden supporters. No matter what has taken place, there must be some group or some idea that we can put responsibility on. When we funnel God into a courtroom like this, demanding that he answer for whatever crime that we're accusing him of, we always forget the radical promises of mercy and forgiveness that God gives us all throughout the story of Holy Scripture. In the aftermath of a worldwide flood which had consumed everything that Noah and his family had previously known, 
We can imagine that these sole survivors were fearful of the life ahead of them. What if God were to do something like this again? Knowing how these terrible events had affected Noah and his family, God, in his great mercy, makes a covenant with them. Their offspring and all living creatures that would one day come after them. While God did see fit to cleanse the world of violent unrest and to cleanse it of unrighteousness, God assures Noah that through this covenant that he establishes, that it will never happen again. God says, never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood. Throughout the great story of scripture, we typically see a covenant as a two-party agreement, as two people agreeing upon a particular deal. In other words, I promise to do this or else, as long as you promise to do that or else. That seems to be the pattern of most covenants in scripture. But with Noah, strangely enough, God makes clear this is a covenant, but there is no expectation for Noah in this covenant. God doesn't say, I won't flood the earth again as long as you do X, Y, and Z. Instead, God simply says, never again. Never again. It may seem odd within our modern context for God to use the symbol of a rainbow to solidify this promise. As many of us know, the color scheme and pattern of a rainbow has been adopted to mean all kinds of things in our modern culture. But in taking a step back into the original context of the story, we gain a much deeper insight as to what God means by giving Noah the symbol. First, we can examine the shape of the rainbow. We miss the warrior aspect of this symbol, but the rainbow was named after the similar shape it has to an archery weapon, a bow. This is made all the more clear when we consider that the Hebrew word for bow and rainbow is the same word all throughout the Old Testament. So in thinking about this, what would a bow pointing towards the sky symbolize for the people of God? In placing a weapon in the sky that points only to himself, God is in effect saying to Noah, if I break this promise that I'm making with you today. May I, God Almighty, be killed. Today, in our post-enlightenment age, we can gain an even fuller context of what the rainbow means. I'm sure most of you weren't expecting an earth science lesson on your way to church this morning, but from a scientific standpoint... A rainbow is a projection of color that comes about as light passes through tiny water droplets in the air. Simply put, a rainbow is what happens when light reveals its true colors through water. This light of the rainbow would give the people of God hope and comfort and protection for generations to come until a new light, the light of the world, would one day come into our darkness to remind us that this covenant with Noah hasn't gone anywhere. Jesus Christ, our Lord, is the fulfillment of God's promise to Noah that he made that day. He reveals himself as the light which overcomes the stormy darkness of our world. And he has taken evidence in himself that God is willing to die for the sake of his people. As light must pass through water to reveal itself as a rainbow, so too does Christ pass through the waters of his baptism to begin his ministry of revelation to the world. In the same way, Jesus calls us to these same waters of baptism so that our true colors, our true light in Christ, may shine before others. While God once declared to Noah, never again shall all flesh be cut off by water. In baptism, God now reconciles us, his children, to him through water. Brothers and sisters, God does not punish indiscriminately for specific sins, but all have fallen short of God's glory. 
The good news we now face is that he has suffered the weight of our punishment and our condemnation in Jesus Christ for our sake. In this way, the rainbow is a foreshadowing of the cross. The evidence of a God that puts his life on the line so that all of us may live and prosper for his name's sake. The rainbow and the cross both give us the same message from God. Never again. Never again will my wrath be poured out upon all humanity. Never again will death reign on earth. And never again, because my light will always outshine the darkness in the very end. The light of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.